Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guests this morning are going to talk with us about brilliant failures and how they are different from epic failures. Joel Shaw is Director of Technology and Innovation at Henkel, which brings us well-known and loved brands like Dial Soaps, RightGuard Antiperspirants, and many different types of laundry detergents, including Snuggle Fabric Softeners. And Stuart Melman is Managing Member of SKM Direction and an alumni of the Innovation Research Interchange. Thank you so much to you both. Stuart and Joel for being on the call. My pleasure. And thank you for the opportunity, Katie. Wonderful. So I'd like to start by asking you to tell us a little bit more about what brilliant failure means. You've both conducted research on this topic. So can you define it for us? Yeah, so we we learned a lot about different types of failure. And what you want to avoid is the epic failures where the cost of the failure greatly exceeds any benefit you get from learnings or or pivots or other things you can implement. So we have a fairly lengthy definition of brilliant failure that we use as part of our research team, but it's basically failing early, failing often. We hear that mantra a lot. It's failing at a small enough scale that what you learn way outweighs what you had to invest before you got to the point where where the failure happened is, is kind of a short summary. Stuart, maybe you can expand. Yeah, a brilliant failure is a project that is well-intended, it's well-prepared, but it doesn't achieve its original goal. Uh, Failed because of something that wasn't knowable uh, when they started the project, but it provides some very useful learning to the organization, which may be relationships, may be improved processes, may be an invention, uh, and it may also be an opportunity to redirect the project so it can succeed. There's lots of uh, benefits that you can learn from failed projects. It seems to me that the innovation community is more recently embracing failure and sort of amplifying the role that that it must play in invention. But do you agree with that? Do you think that historically... Uh, failure has sort of always been part of the innovation process. Uh, w- what are your thoughts on sort of how loud the voice is right now in support and celebration almost of why we need to be accepting of failure and and perhaps exclusively the types of failures that we can learn from? So I think one of the classic examples here, of course, is Thomas Edison, who let you know how many times he had to try something before it failed. And It wasn't a failure to him. It was learning how not to do whatever he was attempting. So I think in innovation, there's certainly a recognition that if you're really being innovative, if you're really pushing boundaries and doing something new, there's an expectation that some extent of failure is inevitable. And there's statistics out there, 70%, 80%, depends on where you look. I mean, a lot of our innovative efforts really should be failing if we're we're being as innovative as we want to be and not just doing sort of the low risk incremental changes. So I think there's sort of a cognitive awareness that, yes, failure is inevitable, and yet sort of culturally, it's not always embraced as failure. I mean, you look at how people get ranked and rated, and and we saw this in some of our interviews. I mean, as much as people say, oh, innovation involves failure, your scientists don't get rewarded for the failed projects, certainly. That's where I think there's sometimes a cultural clash there. So on one hand, we, we know sort of in our heads that failure should come with innovation if we're really being innovative. On the other hand, it's, it's sometimes not easily encouraged within the culture of an organization. As And we tend as a result to be a little risk adverse and skew more towards the incremental changes as opposed to the ones that are going to be more disruptive. Joel, that's such a powerful point, you know, the, the fear that comes with failure. And Figuring out how to create a culture that is okay with that, it's a its a real struggle. Something that I have really appreciated, just to add a little bit of story and, and background to what brought the three of us together, I was at the Innovation Research Interchange in 2019. You, uh, your research team, um, the two of you, along with other folks on your research team, presented findings on brilliant failure, and you had conducted 
uh, several interviews with thought leaders and in innovation. You had conducted a literature review, pulled all of those insights together to ask, what are the different types of failures? Which failures are good and which failures should we try to avoid? And And it came down to that definition that you offered at the beginning of our conversation, which is we want to embrace failures that involve rapid learning and try to avoid failures that involve huge expenditures and very little learning. From all of that, those insights and that definition, you're able to come up with what is essentially a maturity matrix or a maturity model that innovation teams can incorporate into their stage gate or their process. And it's really a guide to determine how you can mature in your ability to fail brilliantly. And I, I love this model. I think it's so incredibly useful. Um, Stuart, could you tell us a little bit more about the maturity model that was created to help embed or, or, or provide a level of comfort and cultural acceptance of brilliant failure inside innovation teams? Yes. The maturity model we created was go through four stages from beginning to improving to succeeding and to being institutionalized. And if we look at the cultural aspect of this that we were just discussing. At the beginning stage, there's a lot of fear of reprisals, that there somebody's career can be hurt if the project fails, uh, finger pointing. And this is not uncommon in large corporations to talk about quality as job one and doing the job right the first time. So when you have that performance culture in operations, it can be difficult when you apply it to R&D. As things improve, management begins to understand that the organization can derive benefit by sharing both successes and failures. And uh, people learn to share their personal failures to start building trust. Uh, as organizations progress even further, they're a real value of failure is recognized throughout out the organization and it's accepted. And finally, when it's in, institutionalized, people uh, are open about things. Reporting is transparent. Uh, people take the time to look at a failed project and identify the small victories that they can build on. And there's strong leadership support for this. So people are very open. The employees ultimately feel very secure and are willing to take risk. I love that depiction. I think it's such a useful methodology, sort of a heuristic that teams can use to really try to strive towards a, a culture that's comfortable talking about failure. So let me ask you a more personal question. Can you share with us on a personal level, or maybe you could talk about a project team that was adjacent to you? Can you share with us some failure stories that, that you've kind of come across? And I'd love to hear if any of them were brilliant failures. I always think of one example of a brilliant failure that was really close to my heart because I project I worked on early in my career. Now, the failures had already happened when I was involved. The project was already a success. But this is the argon oxygen decarburization process, commonly called AOD, for refining stainless steel. Uh, the original work began in the early 50s, over a 13-year development program. There were three clear failures. Each time the team learned from the failure, they pivoted and tried something else, and ultimately they achieved success. And today, 90% of the world's stainless steel is produced by this process. Wow. And it would have been very easy to give up on um, one of those failures, uh, either in the early 50s or mid-50s, around 1960, or even in the mid-60s before it was ultimately commercialized. Stuart, I I'm interested in that story. And, you know, I, I recall from your presentation and, and your research on brilliant failures, you were able to outline the many different types of failures that can happen. It can be misalignment of the team. It can be um, a, a technical challenge that cannot be overcome. It could be the wrong market fit or the, the wrong go-to-market strategy. Uh, what are some of the other kind of common failure types of failures that innovation teams can face? 
I think sometimes there's simply the issue of timing. You may have a good idea, but the wrong time at the mm -hmm. market or the time for the market might come earlier than what you have the idea to launch. We, we certainly saw some situations there. I think one of our, our little illustrations we had in our report out was WD-40, or of course the 40 in WD-40 re refers to the iteration they were on when they finally got their commercial product out the door. Yes. So how do you know when to stop at trial 38 as opposed to pushing until you get to that number 40? I think the persistence there, there's there's so many conditions that have to align to have the commercial success that, that sometimes the failures happen just because one of the, the three pillars of a product just isn't there when you need it to be there. And I think one of the learnings that I took away from our project as we did the research was the idea that, you know, if, if you're making progress, so, so there's this return on failure equation that we saw in, in one of the articles that says, if you're addressing risk and, and solving certain problems as you go, then it's okay to go to the next iteration of investment. What you don't do is keep investing when you're not solving any of the puzzles along the way. So there's there's got to be this decision point where if you're looking at the window of opportunity in the market, you're looking at your business model, how well does your innovation fit the business model, technical feasibility, are you there, the resources, do you have the resources you need? There's all the different things that you consider as part of a project. And I guess hurdles in any one of those could lead to a failure. But if you're balancing along the way the risk versus the investment and, and what you see as your next steps, you can avoid the type of failure I talked about earlier where you're failing at a larger scale than necessary or where the cost of your failure exceeds the learnings you get at the end of the project. So in that way, Joel, story sharing is not exclusive to the sort of aftermath of a failure. There's not only learning that's happening after a project is killed or shelved. It's it needs to be fully pulled into each step of the stage gate, each step of the innovation process, so that if failures are happening along the way, they're made transparent. They People are asked to pull together and learn from them as quickly as they can and, and make those decisions on, on pivoting or moving forward or killing the project, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think I can see two sort of specific applications of storytelling and in some of the research that I saw. So one is through a, a phone interview we did. Someone was talking about, you know, if one of your company leaders gets up on a stage and talks about their contribution to a failure in a project program, whatever, and, and how they learn from it. Interestingly enough, that's not perceived as a weakness in the leader. That's perceived as a strength when they're actually able to get up there and tell the story of how they failed and own that failure. Because what we see and in, in some of the literature also, I mean, if I can blame somebody else for something that went wrong, I will. Um, so when somebody steps up and says, mm -hmm. you know, I own this, this was my failure, but here's here's how we recovered and how we learned from it, that then encourages your entire team to have that sort of same transparency where your failures become learnings as opposed to, to catastrophes. And that sort of honesty and the ability to tell the story in a way that helps people learn from it is one application I see for storytelling. The other thing that I thought was a really interesting learning from our project was people learn from failure the most when they know what their roles are. If you have ambiguity of roles, you get the same thing I just mentioned, where if I can blame somebody else, I will. And so the ability to learn from the failure kind of disappears because people think, well, it wasn't my fault. I have nothing to learn, so I don't have to move forward. So I think at the very start of a project, the more you can tell people how they're going to contribute and what their specific role and responsibility is, the more they will be able to learn from anything that fails within their particular area of responsibility because they'll take ownership for what their responsibilities are. And then they'll apply those learnings themselves as they go to the next stage and prevent that same failure from happening again. Wow, that is incredible. I, I think of the power of credibility building that that has when someone is, when a leader especially is willing to say, I thought this or I made this decision. Looking back, I would have done that differently. Here's what we've learned. Here's how that's going to inform the next decision. That's the type of leader I think most of us would like to follow rather than one who sort of tries to cover up any learnings and, and just really only focus on uh, the things that are positive. There's sort of a, the strength and vulnerability there. Well, and, and I think within innovation, I mean, 
we typically aren't working with really simple, straightforward projects. And the more complex a project is, the more ambiguous the roles can be that are involved in that project. So I think when you have a good leader who's good at explaining to people what he needs or she needs from them and, and what their roles are, you're going to drive not just a successful project, but successful capitalization on where the project may fail because people will be able to understand how the failures relate to them personally and, and learn from them as a result. That's a really critical point. Do you have sort of examples you can share from some of your interviews with thought leaders or from, I, I loved that example from the literature, you're able to pull in the, the, the equation of balancing risk with learning, but do you have other stories you can share about where role definition was clear and therefore learning accelerated more rapidly? I think we saw in, in some of our interviews um, organizations that have sort of institutionalized um, or, or formalized, I guess, a, a way to review projects where if, if there is a failure, they kind of go through the five whys. They ask, well, why this and why and why? You keep, you keep penetrating deeper till you really understand what happened. So I, I think within the, the context of the project, sometimes we found companies that were hesitant to share stories. I mean, as, as you imagine, as, as much as we want to embrace failure, it's still sometimes viewed as a, as a bad word where you don't always get people that want to be completely transparent about things that went wrong. But we do have kind of an, in the general report out like ways that once a project's failed, how do they make sure they learn from it? And, and there's a lot of useful tools out there from the US military and other people we talked to for procedures they have to make sure that if something fails, it's not just kind of buried and swept under the rug. They, they document as much as they can learn from it. In a way, if they can celebrate those failures to some extent in terms of how they've pivoted or how they've learned and made sure they won't have the same failure next time, um, there's still benefit there that that helps the organization move forward. I've seen innovation teams post on LinkedIn uh, <laughs> pictures of themselves eating failure cake together, <laughs> celebrating a failed project before they move on to the next one. Uh, we actually found, I think, a blog and, and a website that just documents failures. I mean, the, the whole point of the blog is to celebrate failure and not in a bad way. I mean, not celebrating the epic failures where, gee, we did something stupid. Everybody laugh at us. It was more celebrating, hey, this is something that failed and it could have been catastrophic, but look how we recovered and what we were able to gain from it. And, and this can be an object lesson maybe for, for other people. So really, at the end of the day, this the main insight here is how do we learn rapidly, learn collaboratively throughout the entire innovation process. Like if you're just waiting until something has been deemed a failure, you're failing to acknowledge the fact that learning is happening throughout the entire process. And if if there are institutional ways and systems or approaches or, or patterns that you can embed into that process, like always asking the five whys or project debriefs or celebration failure cakes, <laughs> uh, you know, that there, there are certain ways to ensure that, that we are learning throughout the entire process. Uh, Katie, I think that's a really good point. Uh, in my former organization, this is not necessarily an innovation, but in our sales process on large projects, if we fail to gain a piece of business, we would do a debrief with the potential customer. And I recall doing one of these one time, and I kept asking the questions and asking the whys. And about half an hour into about a hour meeting, the one of the guys at the customer looked at me and went, where were you for the last five months while we were working on this? If you've been asking these questions then along the way, you will, will probably be our supplier. Oh, um, wow. You know, and our process wasn't to be so open until the end where you either had them as a customer or didn't. And if we had been more open along the way, we might very well have been successful. And uh, it, it's learning to not wait until the end to do the debrief, I think, is really helpful. I love that advice. And, and it's true. I think all of us want to be collaborative partners with the people who are providing services or products to us. And, and yet it's so scary as the product designer, as the innovation leader, to, to ask, 
hey, what do you think? And instead of sort of taking the traditional role of trying to convince uh, someone of, of, of the solution, it's, it's, it's a little more vulnerable to say, hey, this is the offering that we have, or this is the solution we've created. What do you think about this? Does this make sense? You know, I, being very open, I, I've found that, um, I, I know at Untold Content, we've taken that approach a lot more over the years. Maybe when we first started, we felt a little more nervous to ask questions about, you know, from from potential collaborators or partners about our services and offerings. But as we've gone on, it's become such, just such richer conversations and such better solutions that can get created when we're being open to asking those questions. Yeah, we, we had some some typical debrief questions and in, in assessing a failure and, and it kind of goes into the, what did you get from your third party in terms of information so there's questions like well is there something that we didn't know so so is there a failure just because there, there was a communication barrier somehow we missed a key issue we didn't address the key issue in the right way um, there were unintended consequences that we didn't anticipate but then there's also things the question are the things that we knew maybe something that our other party told us but that we just didn't execute on um, and what could we do differently next time? So, so what do we need to mitigate risk now in the, in the future from, from what we discovered kind of belatedly? And, and then, of course, the, the question that always comes up with the failed projects, should we have stopped the project mm-hmm. earlier uh, without the hindsight now? I mean, based on what we knew at the time and what we could have executed at the time, were there warning flags that we missed? Absolutely. And so asking those questions together and being more transparent, I think that's another reminder that the next time our, our team moves forward on a project, we will ask those whys earlier and we'll ask uh, for feedback earlier. Can we zoom out from failure a little bit? Because you're both deeply invested and involved in the innovation community. I would love to know your thoughts on the role that storytelling plays in innovation more broadly, not even just as it relates to trying to create cultures that that accept and learn from failures, but across the, the entire innovation process, where do you see storytelling and story sharing playing a critical role? For me, I see it as really important uh, now in my consulting business, I mostly help small companies, uh, startups, and try to help them get deals with large companies. And a, a small startup may have a internal culture, but they don't have a lot of experience as a company. And often what I'm doing is telling stories about my experience over my career, about dealing with other companies and how things can either go well or not go well, try to shape what the client will do to be more successful. And uh, it's even gotten to the point with some long-term clients uh, will be on the subway somewhere after a dinner meeting and they'll look at me and say, okay, another story. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, the, 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 they know it, they, they like hearing them and they do get something out of them uh, it, it really is a valuable way to with a real life example to teach people what is an appropriate behavior and I think from my perspective um, so I'm in the innovation function at Henkel but, so, so we have dedicated innovation personnel but there's this misperception sometimes that innovation is the job of a particular function, whether it's your product developers or your project managers. And truthfully, innovation belongs to everybody in an organization. It can be a business model innovation. It could be an innovation the way we do our financial reporting. So we need everybody to kind of own the responsibility to innovate within the organization. And the problem is sometimes we get siloed in functions and the functions have totally different languages. So what will motivate a chemist to work on a really promising project will probably mean nothing to somebody in, in a different part of the building. So I think where storytelling comes in is, is how these people communicate across their responsibilities so that everybody has sort of the same passion and same vision for what our next big thing is going to be as an organization. So being able to be relevant to a person where they sit in a way that we can all be one team and, and sort of share our approach towards a goal, I think that's where storytelling can really deliver a lot. 
a value for us. Yes, yes, I completely agree. I, I see wherever there are silos, that's an opportunity to try to use story to make sure that we can try to align our missions or our resources, our talents or our, our assets or our understanding of the market. Or There are so many uh, opportunities there. And if we're not communicating well and making those that alignment possible, it's really easy for people to have disbelief or disinterest or, or even fear of change internally, especially, you know, it can be difficult for people who aren't sort of labeled as the innovators to, uh, to embrace change in quite the same way that the innovation team has the expectation of embracing change. And so thinking as an innovation team about how to speak the language that operations is speaking or that marketing is speaking and being able to pitch ideas to them in a way that aligns with how they see the organization and, and what resources are at their fingertips, that's such a, a critical and important task to, to use communication to build those bridges. I think we've already addressed this question, but I would love to hear from both of you why it is so scary to tell failure narratives and are there any other strategies that you can share about uh, helping people at the individual level get comfortable with doing that? So it's it's kind of funny. We kind of cringe every time we go and we ask somebody, hey, are you willing to be a subject matter expert on failure? Right? Because <laughs> I, I think failure still has pretty negative connotation to it. So I think we mentioned earlier, even though conceptually we recognize that failure is part of innovation, it's still not something that people see as worth bragging about, I guess, or, or, or telling stories about. So I think how you phrase the question sometimes or how you phrase um, the assessment sometimes has a lot of weight. So one of our findings is, well, rather than asking somebody, hey, did your project fail? You can ask, did you learn from the project or what did you create from the learnings? Um, and Hopefully failure, if it's the right type of failure, it will produce learnings. And it's much easier to recognize the fact that we learned something. We learned, even if it's learning how not to do the project, that's still sort of the better way to to start, the, I guess, an interview or a question with somebody. And then as you get, identify those learnings, I mean, you can praise those little discoveries or use them, leverage the learnings for the next project that comes out. So it's kind of viewing failure as just a a step on the path of innovation. I mean, that's that's what we conceptually, I think, embrace, but sometimes don't culturally recognize. And I think for innovators, sometimes knowing at the start of a project, there's an awful lot of uncertainties and there's a fear of overselling up front and then being sort of called to task later. So they maybe can hedge their bets early on. And, and that's where storytelling maybe is a little challenging for them because not wanting to inspire people too much until you have all the uncertainties resolved. But I, I think if we know that the end of the story, there's going to be some recognition for what we've learned as opposed to just the recognition that we failed. Um, that's kind of what we need to drive people forward. That's such a, an important point for us to, to kind of pause on that storytelling can have a negative connotation uh, from back when we were kids. And if you were telling a lie, someone in your community might say, oh, you're telling stories. <laughs> um, and so that pressure to be able to reveal the potential of the project or the concept or the prototype without overpromising that's really the fine line that you have to balance in, in any really good innovation story because the story itself and its beauty and its ability to show impact and personal relevance, that's one important factor. But if there's no substance, if there's not enough substance to back that, that is not going to be an effective innovation story. So including in that same conversation, here are the technical challenges or the market challenges that we know might happen. Here's how we're going to approach them. Here are the things we don't know, uh, but we could know as part of the process. And uh, and maybe also here's a recognition of the things that we don't know and we really can't know. And we're going in with an awareness as much as possible of those risks. So really not uh, sugarcoating that that pitch and, and only having the ability to speak to 
impact, but also have that more grounded layer of, of vulnerability. And that that in itself, like you mentioned earlier, with the that image of the, the leader admitting to something that failed, that actually is a credibility producer. Absolutely. But there's also the, the issue that in some organizations that are so performance driven, even talking about success and telling stories about success could be seen as not working on the important stuff of having the next success. So the, the people can be like, well, all they do is they, they talk, you know, they're, they're not doing anything. But in reality, sharing both the successes and the failures throughout the organization is important to creating the culture and so people learn from each other. But it's not always so easy to not have people sniping at one. So uh, even when the uh, IRI leadership team was approving this project, and on one of the calls, some of my colleagues started giving me a hard time about saying, oh, so you're going to become an expert on failure. That's what we always suspected. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a really great point that what if we approached success stories with the same lens and we said, you know, some successes are even more amplified or, or they have more a bigger impact on our organizations when we can show the learnings that happen throughout that success and after it versus the kind of successes that sort of turn into bragging rights and are really just ego inflators. And then we're not actually embedding more cultural values or or being able to coach other people on our teams about why that was successful and what that meant. So I'd never really thought of it until this moment, but um, some of these lessons that we're applying to how we talk about failure should really also be applicable to how we talk about our successes. Yeah, I think it it would be interesting in cases when when there is a sort of a stellar success, we recognize the success sometimes and people get extra credibility, but we don't always look at what came before the success. So I, I think that's, again, to assessing learnings from failure. Well, what learnings came along the way? I mean, if it's a if it's a truly disruptive innovation from a company, you can almost guarantee that it wasn't a straight sort of A to B path that delivered the results. Yes. So as you recognize the success, recognizing also the journey that got you there and talking again about the different functions in, in an organization that are responsible for innovation. There's people that were probably involved on day one that worked really hard, had a lot of failures. And by the time you get to the finish line, they've kind of faded into the background. Their hands aren't directly on the product anymore. So I think when an organization can recognize those people and the contribution they made, even after they've lost some of the visibility or direct hands on, that's another part I would see storytelling playing where, Hey, it's not just the people that push the final product over the finish line. It's all the people that push the product along the way before that. And when you get that whole story, that motivates the early stage people to keep working hard and getting through their failures and, and the learnings that they can capture as a result as well. That is so true. That's incredible advice. As we wrap up, could you both share any other advice that you would give to innovators as they prepare to share their great ideas? So I think for me, from, from this project, uh, the most or one of the most memorable outputs is just the equation we have for return on failure. And I think this came from Dan Ward's book, Fire is where I saw it. Um, and it's just return on failure is assets gained from the experience over the investment you had to make. So I think as an innovator, recognizing that some investment always has to be there. So you're going to have to take some risks, but make them smart risks and just make sure as, as each stage of your innovation progresses that you're learning something new so that if it fails at any point, you at least have a track record of learnings that you can say, well, we didn't completely fail. We just learned up to this point how not to do things. Mm -hmm. So keeping that balance all the way through the innovation. So for each increase in investment, you hopefully have an increase in what you've learned. So you have something to capture at the end of the project, regardless of, of the, the final outcome. That's, I think, one of the things that's really going to stick with me after this project. Yeah, the, the big piece of advice I would give people is simply to be bold. Recognize that it's better to have tried and failed 
than never to have tried. Uh, you know, if you get done with the project, you went, oh, well, it's all over, but gee, we didn't try to do that. That would have seemed like too big of a step, but maybe that step would have been successful. And don't be afraid to try things. Um, Because if you learn from what you try, even if it doesn't succeed, you'll benefit yourself and the organization. Thank you, Joel and Stuart. Thank you so much for your advice, for those words. Uh, I'm really moved by them. And I know that the perspiring innovators listening to this podcast feel the same way. So uh, let's embrace failure. Let's learn rapidly. Let's celebrate success, but learn and embed learning and recognition into our successes. And let's not be afraid to be bold. Thank you guys for being on the podcast. Hey, thank you, Katie. Yep. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. Untold Content.